You know, when we first got involved in this scene, you know, we just, I thought it was for everybody. You know, everybody needs this. Everybody should go. Everybody should drink ayahuasca. Everybody should do the work. And uh, yeah, that's a lot more than a lot of people than a lot of people can handle. You know, facing your inner demons and and your and your your cultural constraints. It's it is a lot. Um, and people will come when they're ready, and they don't have to. And everyone's on a different path. So it's it's not for me to say it's for anyone or not for anyone. Um, everyone is on a specific journey, and I believe life only gives you exactly what you can handle, and not a droplet more. You know, and for me to say to anyone to direct them in any way would be, you know righteous or something and so no it's not it's not for everybody for sure but those that are interested the information is becoming uh far more available you know and accessible and you know these retreats are far more available than they've ever been and they're getting you know way safer not that they weren't safe before but now you can go to you know first class resorts and and experience these things in in an environment that really sort of gives you the uh the upper hand so to speak as far as being comfortable Welcome to the Witness Circle. If you made it here, it means you done put in the work, dude. Congratulations. You made it way past the basics. This goes for a massive celebration. Welcome to the Witness Circle. We all winning here. We all winning here. We all winning here. Welcome to the Witness Circle. We winning here. We all winning here. We all winning here. We all winning here. Jeffrey, what's up? What's happening? Thanks for coming by. Oh, you're welcome. It was very spontaneous. This was very spontaneous. Yeah. You're like, do you want, you know, what are you up to? Can I come over? And yeah, yeah here well, we you are. You sent me that picture this morning. We were in an airplane. We were in an airplane. Yeah. yeah. Do you miss those days? And that was a call. Dan wants me to come visit. That's how <laughs> I read that. Visiting day. Just reminiscing on old photos of us. Yeah, there's so many. <laughs> They're all very exciting. Do you remember how sick I was that day? Uh, I do remember how sick you were that day. Yeah, it was uh, unexpected. Sickest person I've ever had in in, in the airplane so yeah. far because you couldn't get off the floor for an hour. Yeah, that was new. Well, for those that don't know, he took me up in his uh, extra. It's a aerobatic airplane, and I was just like oh, on the hangar floor for like at least <laughs> half an hour after. Yeah, that was new. It was horrible. I've never incapacitated anybody after the flight. Usually they're okay once we stop, but that was like we're, I'm going to lay on the floor for an hour or so here. Yeah. <laughs> It was very horrible. white. He was that, very oh, white. That's not the plane you crashed, is it? On your Instagram? The, the one, one you made? made aid? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I showed Jeff that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. Um, we got young Jamie here today. Yes, sir. Oh, very good. He usually doesn't chime in. on You watch Joe Rogan, right? Yeah, no. no I mean, a little Remember? bit. Okay. Yeah, He's sometimes. got his, his Jamie. So this is our young Jamie. Oh, very yeah. good. Well, I want to talk about some interesting stuff. Whatever today. you want. Okay. Sure. Anything. Anything. <laughs> Ish. Um, I mean, I've known you since the start of your, I don't even know what kind of journey would you call it? Like I, I knew you when you went to your first ayahuasca, what would you call it? Trip, I guess. Yeah. To Costa Rica. Sure. Ceremony. So what do you think led you there and uh, how was your first experience? Oh, what led me there? You know, I really don't know what entirely what led me there. Um, curiosity, I suppose, uh, like an insatiable desire to experience something, uh, unknown, you know, to find out, uh, you know, what's going on here. And I, I sort of researched it that button and I showed it to Tiff and I'm like, well, we got to go to Peru and do this thing. It's amazing. And I said, would you go, you know, into the jungle? And she says, no, I never do that. I'm like, oh, well, that <laughs> sucks. And then later I found uh, Rhythmia, which is a five star kind of a resort kind of tricked her into it i sent her pictures and they had a pool and a spa and all this stuff and i said you want to go here and she's oh yeah that place looks nice and then we signed up and and then later she found out what, you know what was happening but it was, it was kind of like a fluke thing yeah yeah and your first experience there wasn't i don't know if you want to call it the greatest because it's i know looking back now you're learning life lessons but sure tough thing to go through in your first time i think or? it's always tough um it's very paradoxical to describe it because it's the most challenging and it's the greatest thing and it's you know it's it's horrifying and it's beautiful all the same thing and and uh i think the closer you get to the truth of anything it's very paradoxical like you can't ever definitively say you know something is beautiful because then all beauty is you know an inherent you know darkness and so it's more of a revealing of the like the totality of all things as opposed to oh my god it was beautiful and i danced with angels Uh, (laughs) but it was really dark for me for the most part um, but it was really bright and light for Tiff. So we got this uh, diversity of experiences uh, that we got to compare and talk about. But on the first night, I was it was so challenging and so difficult and just 
brought me to such a dark place. And I, I remember thinking, oh my God, I brought Tiff here. Like, what have I done? You know, like the love of my life, like sort of tick, you know, said, let's go to do this thing. And I'm over here suffering and, and visiting all sorts of layers of hell and felt so bad for putting her through this. And that just tore me apart. And I couldn't wait for the night to end so I could apologize to her. And then when the night finally ended and I could find her and I'm like, I'm so sorry. And she's like, that was amazing. So I was like, what's going on? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I've always, and I haven't done it yet. Um, It's huge on my bucket list, but I've been told it like kind of makes you face your, your fears really. Would you say that's true? It makes you aware of them. You know, I think that's the first, the first thing that happens. A lot of us aren't aware of our fears. You know, we're not aware of the darks, um, sort of conditioning that we carry with us. So the first step is awareness. Um, you know, it's, oh my God, I didn't know I was, had so much fear around so many issues. Um, and then, yeah, then you, you sort of face them, which means you go into them, you know, deeply. Uh, and it, it pulls you into them uh, for as long as needs to be until they, and then they transform. So all, all fears are energy transformed. And the transformation of everything is, is, is love. Um, and those fears are there to teach you um, you know, to, to not be afraid, basically, which is, which is a paradoxical thing. It's like, no, you got to go this way because there's nothing to fear. I don't want to go there. It's no, you have to come here. Come here and I'll show you it's okay. And so you kind of step through that fire, of, you know, like an illusory flame that you've been afraid of your whole life. And then you put your hand through it and you realize it's, it doesn't burn you. And, uh, but it looks like it's going to burn you. So that's, and that's the terrifying part, you know, because it feels very, very real and it is. And is it real in the sense of, like, are you seeing this happen in your imagination as you're yeah. in ceremony? Yeah. Yeah, there's visuals. And it could take you to places. Everyone has different experiences. Uh, um, you know, that some of these fears can take visuals. Some people see snakes or they see demons or whatnot. And, and for other people, it's just, a you know, like a visual of an energy. For me, it's more of a like a sensation or a feeling or an emotion. You know, and there can be... You know, sometimes there's really whacked out stuff you're seeing, like laughing faces or, you know, you can, you know, you can feel like if you if embarrassment was something that you've dealt with as a child or you got really embarrassed, you might go to a place and feel like you're in grade three and the whole classroom was laughing at you. Uh, and you might go back and relive that moment, you know, and then you see, oh, my gosh, like this is this is sort of uh, ruled my life. This fear of embarrassment, it's uh, directed me to avoid certain situations or to not be authentic in certain situations because of this fear so you go back to that point in grade two and you realize that's where it started from and that's where it came from then you just dissolve that by sitting in it that's crazy to me <laughs> yeah <laughs> the there's a big stigma around i guess psychedelics and stuff even i think it's becoming more people are becoming a lot more open to it now but um from everyone i've talked to it seems to be extremely beneficial I don't know why there's been this like giant stigma around it for so long. Yeah, well, I think there's a general um, a, a, like a, like an ignorance uh, in, in the culture. I think for most people, believe are far more advanced and far more aware and far more you know uh, responsible than we actually are. Um, you know, in this culture, we're trained to go a certain way and believe certain things, and we accept uh, authority from those that pass it down to us, whether it be our parents or our governments or, or religions or whatnot. And the question that requires, uh, you know, like a lot of courage and nature rewards that courage, right? Um, it, it's becoming more, I mean, obviously mainstream. There's, there's organizations that have uh, taken huge steps in bringing these things to the public and bringing them to legality in Oregon and California. And, you know, so many of the psychedelics are now becoming recognized as what they are, which is healing medicines. You know, they're, they're plants from the earth and they heal you. Uh, that's why there's no, you know, rehab mushroom clinics, you know, at no LSD rehabilitation centers. There's no ayahuasca. It, you know, uh, it, uh, these things heal. You know, they, they might be challenging, and the healing path might not be, you know, an enjoyable experience at the start. But, I mean, the statistics are becoming really obvious now. Yeah, I know they, like, as far as um, mushrooms and stuff, they're starting to use them a lot more. And MDMA, I've seen starting to come to the table now to help treat uh, PTSD and stuff as well. So Yeah, well, MDMA is one of the front runners now. I think there's an organization called MAPS, which is the multi multidisciplinary. You can look it up and see, and see <laughs> what it says. But he, um, this fellow, Rick Dalbin, has been fighting for 30 years to bring MDMA to the surface, for specifically for dealing with PTSD. Mm-hmm. 
uh, and now it's it's in the process of being approved, and it just, it allows you to to revisit, you know, the trauma in your life and view it from a place of of love, mm-hmm. um, and then you can rewrite it. You know, the, the trauma gets to be experienced again from a place of understanding and compassion and love, and you know, it can, you can release some of that responsibility that you put on yourself from. You know, most people feel they they're responsible for their trauma. There's just so much more going on, you know, than than what meets the eye, and so it's a phenomenal tool. The one thing I've seen with a lot of people when I, when I've talked about these types of things is that um, a lot of people don't want to change, even though you know there might be things sure. going on, but they're yeah. not they're they're not ready. Yeah, and, and they don't have to. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not for us to say. Uh, you know, when we first got involved in this scene, you know, we just, I thought it was for everybody. Everybody needs us. Everybody should go. Everybody should drink ayahuasca. Everybody should do the work, and uh, yeah, that's a lot more than a lot of people than a lot of people can handle. You know, facing your inner demons and and your and your your cultural constraints. It's it is a lot, um, and people will come when they're ready, and they don't have to. And everyone's on a different path, so it's it's not for me to say it's for anyone or not for anyone. Um, everyone is on a specific journey, and I believe life only gives you exactly what you can handle, and not a droplet more. You know, and for me to say to anyone to direct them in any way would be, you know, righteous or something. And so, no, it's not, it's not for everybody for sure. But those that are interested, the information is becoming uh, far more available, you know, and accessible. And, you know, these retreats are far more available than they've ever been. And they're getting, you know, way safer, not that they weren't safe before, but now you can go to, you know, first class resorts and and experience these things in in an environment that really sort of gives you the, uh, the upper hand, so to speak, as far as being comfortable. I know um, I've even seen like some celebrities talking about it now, but Aaron, is it Aaron Rodgers? Oh, there's tons. Yeah. <laughs> Mo- I mean, most recently, Will Smith. Really? Yeah, he went and uh, and he, it's in his book. I don't know. I, I don't read books, but he wrote a book about his journey. What do you mean you don't read books? You got some. Well, I read, read I very <laughs> few. I read like, you know, some spiritual stuff like Adishante and, and uh, Krishnamurti. Um and uh, I like those guys because even when you read their stuff, they say, you know, don't believe us, please. And you're like, yeah, I get it. Because <laughs> uh, then you're accepting their version of reality. And this whole life's about, you know, realizing that, you know, you are the creator of your own, your own world. Mm-hmm. It, it is yours. It's not mine. You know, anything I tell you, you accept as a belief, you're not free. You're buying into what I'm saying. It's not your direct experience. You know, so life is for direct, directly experiencing, which most of us can't do or don't do because we've been implanted already with uh, conditioning, right? So this is freeing that. But uh, Will Smith, yeah, he went and he's got some YouTube. If you YouTube Will Smith ayahuasca, he's, he's starting to release some uh, talks about his journey and, and whatnot. And it's great. You know, it's just, uh, you know, more people getting exposed and uh, that this is okay. It's safe to do. You should try it. You know, water's warm. Jump in. That's crazy. I, I did not know that. Yeah. Of all people. Of <laughs> <laughs> all people, yeah. Um, sorry, did you it's, find it? Yeah, it's a um, multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, and that's sort of the for, you know the, the foundation of a psychedelic movement in the States for the last 20 or 30 years, yeah. And, and, and one of the episodes of, uh, what is it, uh, How to Regrow Your Brain or Retrain Your Mind or whatever, it's on Netflix, I think it's episode episode three or four. It talks about uh, Rick Dobman's journey through maps. Really good stuff. Yeah, that's crazy. I've never even heard of it before till now. Yeah. Um, one thing I find I struggle with a little bit is in the when I'm around kids and stuff. Like you know, there's when you talk about letting them have their experiences and stuff. Is there like a point where your opinion or you know, disciplinary things need to come into play. Like, are you and or you might be telling them something? Is that now changing their experience? Well, we have to give children a foundation to sort of operate in, right? And when when, you, when you're doing that, and this is just my opinion, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can you can come across as a parent, you know, the traditional form, and 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 give them sort of like rules. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is acceptable. This is not acceptable. This is how you act. This is how you don't act. Uh, and then there's, there's a different way, you know, there's a way to come at it and say, you know, what, I, I don't really know what's going on, you know, with you, but I can share with you my experience, not to say that that's right or that's wrong, but here's what I've found, you know, and I've got a, a teenager right now and he's in grade, whatever, 10. And I look what I was doing in grade 10, you know, so you know that there's drugs around, you don't know how involved he is and you're, you're trying to create this environment of safety, right? 
And so I had the drug talk, you know, with him. And I said, uh, you know, I'm not very parenty. Uh, I wasn't, you know, born to be your parent. I was born Jeff, you know, and, you know, he laughed. And I said, we're going to have the drug talk now. And I said, I said, so I asked myself, what would I want to say to myself if I was like 15 and I wanted some good advice, not some parental advice, don't do drugs or, you know, because that, that didn't help, you know, for me. It was like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and all this stuff doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to experience this because that's what, that's where my draw was at the time in grade 10 and all, with, all that. So I just sort of laid out like, here's my experience. Here's the drugs that I would stay away from. Here's drugs that, you know, and here's what happens when you take them. I said, if you're going to, if you're going to do marijuana, I said, just maybe don't eat it, you know, <laughs> like right away, <laughs> you know, like stay away from the edibles. Like if you're going to try it, you know, try the smokable version, because if you eat, it, it's going to last forever. And if you have a, if you have a bad experience, it's going to go on and on and on and you won't be able to get away from it. But if you try it and you smoke it, you know, it's, it's going to pass. It's going to come on. There's going to be this experience in about an hour. It's going to shift. So if it comes on and you're very uncomfortable and you're afraid, just find a safe place. You know, go to go to a room or find a spot and just know that in 45 minutes, this is going to pass and you'll be able to function again and, and this fear will lift. And I flat out said, I said, I never enjoyed marijuana. My experience with it was I was always paranoid. It always made me antisocial. Um, I said, I never could understand why anybody did it, but I did it anyway because everyone was doing it but I knew what was going to happen. And so, you know, I said, make sure your environment's safe because you're going to pick up on the energies in the room. So if you're in a strange place in a strange crowd, just maybe is in the best place because you could get really anxious and really nervous. So maybe do it in a smaller setting in a safer setting and, you know, don't, don't push the limits of it. And if anything goes haywire, you got to f- like phone, phone me. I can be mad at you. Not at all. I want you to be safe. I want you to know that you can call me and we're not going to freak out. That's your life. It's your experiences. You know, I said, you know, stay away from all the drugs that go up your nose. They're just, they're bad. They're just, you know, stay away from that stuff. And I said, if you're going to do psychedelics, um, you know, just know that they're going to open you right up. And so again, like, who are you with? What's your set? What's your setting? Where are you at? If you're with a lot of people, you're going to feel all their energies. So just, you know, be very cautious when you're going to do this stuff, who you're going to do it with. What's your escape plan? What, you know, if things go bad and you get really afraid, you know, where can you go and what can you do and who can you call? And it was just this free conversation about advice from that a friend would give a friend as opposed to a parent to a child. Now I could get flambéed for that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but the kids are going to do what they're going to do. They're going to experience and they're going to experiment and all their other friends are going to, you know, suggest things and have this open door to be like, you know, you're going to do this stuff and here's a safe way to do it. And I said, the opiate things are really bad. I said, you know, it's don't, just don't take any pills because you don't know what's in them. You don't know what's in them. There could be stuff in there that'll kill you. And opiates are just, they're just not good. They're going to make your itch, itchy and, and uh, the addiction, you know, said your brain starts to grow new receptacles because it likes this drug. And then it gets really hungry and it needs this drug. So just you skip those. There's just no benefit. You know, so in the world of drugs, there's healing drugs and there's harmful drugs. Uh, and there's drugs that can be enjoyable and done responsibly, you know, won't interfere with your life. Uh, but if they're hidden and they're used as an escape and they're used to escape the daily pain and the daily grind, you know, this is where the problem comes in. You know, so it was just opening that door for a whole new perspective as opposed to the traditional, don't do this, this is bad, it'll ruin your life. Because then the door is closed and then they don't want to hear anything you got to say anymore. And then they're going to hide it all because they know what your opinion is. So it's, it's a tricky thing, parenting. <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing about it, but I'm learning. You know? Yeah, absolutely. How, how would you say that conversation went? Like, did he take it? I'm sure that's, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, like you said, it's probably the best way to keep the doors open with your kids because yeah. otherwise they're just going to shut you. I mean, yeah. I, I did that, and I'm sure you probably did that, like, you just close off. Yeah. You have no interest in getting this advice from a parental figure. Yeah. Because they don't know what you're going through. They just flat out don't. You know, I, I know what it was like to go through what I went through going through school. And, and uh, you know, I felt very separate and segregated and, and I didn't fit in. And, and then there's, there's you know, all these uh, expectations on how I'm supposed to act. And it was brutal because it just none of it made sense to me. And I, I know that's every individual's journey. And when they're, when they're young and they're going through school, the number one thing is to fit in. 
They're looking for an identity. They're looking for a group. To, they want to know how they fit into the society. Where do I belong? Who am I? You know, I went through a whole bunch of identities. I was a skater. I was a rock star. I was a weirdo. I was a race car driver. I just didn't, you know, I could wear all these hats, but none of them were authentically me. They were all fake. And, you know, it's okay to be, it's not only okay to be, it's your, it's your destiny to be authentic, to be true to yourself. And nobody fits in with anybody because we're all unique individuals. There's 8 billion individuals. That's the whole point of having an individual life journey is to find out who you are, not who someone else is and they look good. And I was told that's the way it's like, no, no, you know, who are you authentically and don't fit in, you know, be, be sort of free. So yeah, I think that conversation went really good. You can tell when they're, when they're engaged, when they're open because they're listening and they're laughing and you have their attention. I mean, this isn't rocket science. I know you, I have your attention because I look into your eyes and I can see you're engaged with me and we have this ability as humans to know when people are open and engaged. Um, and it's like a sixth sense. So, you know, yeah, he's, in, he's listening to me, he's engaged with me, he's laughing, he's nodding. When you come down from a parental standpoint and you start doing the parental thing, then they shut off. And you know that too because they're looking away, they're kind of rolling their eyes, they're fidgeting, they just want you to shut up and be done. Uh, but whenever you have that opening, that opening of engagement, there's a window there to communicate, to connect with that person, that child, that other human being, whoever it is. And, you know, that's sort of the gift of, you know, humanity is like, can you open that door with people? You know, yes. Can you know? And when you do, what are you going to do with that opportunity? If for people you meet, even if it's in the grocery store, you have an opportunity to open that door with a laugh, a giggle, or a smile, or a help, or a comment. Uh, and then your heart's kind of meet and connect. And then you're kind of meeting yourself, and it's the most beautiful thing, you know, to meet yourself and someone else. But most of the time we go around closed off and we're thinking in our minds, and we're not concerned about the world around us because we're worried about our own affairs. But if you take the time to open your heart and open your, your soul and walk through a grocery store, it can be one of the most spiritual experiences imaginable because you start to see yourself and everyone, and you recognize their patterns, and you can see who's anxious and who's upset and, who's rushing down the aisle to get the groceries to get home and who's frustrated, who's really enjoying, you know, it's just every minute, uh, you know, can be a journey of self exploration once you open up, you know, sort of that inner eye in your heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lesson I think all of us can use for sure. I've seen a lot of parents who take the strict parenting route and then, you know, their children turn out to be some of the wildest <laughs> children. <laughs> well, so. yeah, you know, it, it really, uh, it flames the wrong fire, so to speak, in, in a way. Um, but again, who's to say that's wrong? You know, because that just, you know, every everybody's got this journey and they get exactly what they need for their own personal development and growth. And so, um, you know, sometimes really difficult childhoods are the foundation for really beautiful lives later on. So would you say the psychedelic side of things helps you, I don't even know the word, but like helps you, learn faster like learn these lessons faster that might take a long long time for you to figure out yeah i mean that's a very good question um i mean my, I, I guess i have to say yes to that um, i guess it opens you up more to to sort of take in a bigger picture you know and and sort of uh like let go of maybe the pattern that you thought was reality and it allows reality to, to show itself to you. Um, and I don't, know if, I don't want to say quicker, but it just allows that to, to just reveal itself more on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of it, however they work, um, it's more like a reset. And it allows you to be open, open to receive like the intelligence of the world, of the plants, of the universe, of the stars, of this everybody. I've noticed that in you because I, like, like I said in the beginning, I've known you from... I've known the Jeff before and yeah. I know the Jeff now and, um, you know, back in the day, it was like busy man running to dealership, like you're on the go all the time. Now I find you're very present even with your kids when I'm there. Like if, if they're looking for your intention, you're very engaged with them, which, you know, that's something that every parent could probably be better at. Right. Cause we just get so busy and we're doing all the day to day yeah. stuff. And yeah. Yeah. Well, we really, we really, we really miss it. You know, that was the first thing that I, uh, <clears throat> you know, that I had to sit with, 
was that for the first 30 years or 35 years or whatever it was, I mean, it was all about Jeff. It was about how am I going to enjoy my life, all, yeah, right? It was like I'm going to enjoy my life was the priority. Race cars and, you know, marry the super hot wife and have kids and make money and, and, and do all sorts of extreme sports. And it was just about me, 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 right? And it was just so unfulfilling, you know, and, um, all these experiences, they come and they go and the adrenaline stuff is like, you, you, was, you just got to keep topping it. You know, like we used to go, you know, all the time, um, on these mountain trips. And if, you know, if, so, if somebody didn't have a near death experience, you, you know, it wasn't worth talking about. And that was it. it was, and so, so every, every weekend you're going, you're right on the edge of dying because we're pushing the limits of everything we do. And it was very, you know, not satisfactory. And in the meantime, my kids are kind of growing up and my only priority is my next trip, my next race, you know, the next thing. Uh, and this really just stopped all that. And I said, Mike, you know, look what you're missing. You know, it, look at the magic of these little people and the giggles and their laughs and the freedom and the love that just exudes out of them, you know, and it, it was, uh, it was hard for a while because I realized how much of it I missed. Um, and then you just start to become present and then you forgive yourself for missing it. You know, self forgiveness is a huge part, you know, um, because we all come up short if we're, you know, cause that's just the way we are. You know, we, we're totally imperfect beings <laughs> and we've got to forgive ourselves, you know, because yeah, we're not perfect. We're on a journey, but we don't know where it's going and we don't know what it's about. And when you find out the simplicity of it all, it's shocking because it's always been right there in every moment. And the kids are like the biggest teachers because they're so innocent and they're so pure and they, and they just want your love, you know. It's so easy to give it to them and they just want to give it back. But they start to close down if they see you're closed down and that causes, you know, lifelong trauma for them too. So. Yeah, well, it definitely makes sense. It's... uh. It's tough, like you said, carrying around that weight, and a lot of people don't forgive themselves. Um, I mean, I've experienced that before, and you know, it's it's a heavy thing to be carrying that around yeah. all the time. Yeah, but, I mean, we're definitely not perfect. No, not at all. Uh, you know, and everyone's on the same journey. You know, and we have to know our limitations too. Like, we can't heal the world. You know, there's people suffering in all of our families and our close circles, and you want to come and and help them, but we don't know how. And and we, you know, we wished everyone could you could just drop, <laughs> you know, their you know, their facade and just meet and just meet as authentic human beings and go, Oh my God, I love you. I've always loved you. There's no problems. You don't ever have to do anything to earn my love. I just authentically love you. Uh, and when, when that part of you opens up, you realize that not only do you love your near family members, you can, this is for everybody and everybody, nobody's excluded from this. Nobody. And that's another, you know, like a, uh, like a stretch. It's like, well, what about, you know, the bad people? the people that deserve to be punished. What about, you know, like this is where the mind comes in because it doesn't like the fact that we're all, you know, pure love. You know, everything we see that we don't like is, is inside of us somehow that that person represents a part of us that we don't want to look at, that we can't face, that we're, we, we have to say that is not love. That is like bad and it doesn't deserve it. But that's not true. You know, everybody is suffering. If you, all the, if you look at all the bad, harmful people, they would have gone through something in their childhood or their parents' childhood you know, that, that caused a pattern of hurt. And then that hurt is trying to heal itself. And it, and it can't make sense of this world, so it lashes out and hurts others. Makes sense. I've, um, yeah, a lot of things coming into perspective right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, you know, and like you see people doing things and I think our natural reaction is to judge them. Or, yeah. And I mean, and I've been the one being judged before too. Sure. And, you know, it's it's not a fun place to be. But, you know, like you said, everyone's going through their journey and, yeah. None of us are perfect. And I'm sure we've always done, re we've, you know, in the past, everyone's done something shitty in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It's a process of self forgiveness and, and forgiveness for others. And, um, you know, and, and through, through meditation and for, and mindfulness, you, you know, can start to see, you know, what's going on in your own mind on a daily basis. And with a little bit of attention, you start to see how critical thinking is and how judgmental and how separative it is. You know, and then you can start looking at thought. You know, well, what's this all about? Why is this voice in my head? And it's constantly negative, you know, or it's always projecting a future. Whatever's happening now is never good enough. You know, you drive down the road and try to be present for five minutes. Say, so, I mean, see how uncomfortable it is to not, you feel like you're wasting your time because you're so worried about what's going to happen when you get home or you're crucifying yourself over the past or something that happened today. 
or you're rewriting a conversation, something you should have said, like the mind is just one of the biggest blockages between us and being totally present. Um, one of the biggest things you, I'm like, it's stuck with me for a long time that you told me is like, you're not your thoughts. Yeah, so, clearly. You know, I used to, but you know, there's, I used to attach myself to a lot of these things yeah. I'm thinking about Yeah, and they would, it would affect me. And yeah. like, you're, you know, I think you, when we were talking about meditation, you're like, just let them kind of float by. Yeah. Like don't attach yourself to that thought. Cause you were thinking, what is it like 90,000 thoughts a day or something? Yeah. Crazy. It's like 50 it's, to 80,000, yeah, maybe a hundred thousand, yeah. you know, you know, for more. And, and, and I'm all, like a meditative state is one where, where there's, where there is no thought present. But meditation itself is sort of the practice of observing the thoughts, you know. So when someone's sitting in a chair uh, and they're practicing meditation, which is a practice because it just, it is, it's something you just practice. You can start by watching your thoughts. Just sit there and don't try to get rid of them because the you that's getting rid of them is a thought as well, right? It's, it's an ego thought going, okay, I'm going to get rid of the thought. But the I that's getting rid of the thought is also a thought and the whole thing just starts to get really messy and confusing and get for just watch them go by and what you'll notice is uh they start somewhere and then they follow and they go off in tangents all over the place but they're always passing i mean if you if you sat let's say you did a 15 minute meditation and you could diarize this which you really is tough to do because you're meditating but you start out with this one thought whatever it might be oh i can't wait for this to be over oh and then just watch where it goes it goes all over the place and it's and then it starts making these judgments and these critical comments and you know uh, it just doesn't like to be still but in meditation you get to see how much of this stuff is actually going on so you sit there and go i didn't meditate at all i just sat there for 15 minutes and i and i thought i could i couldn't i couldn't stop my thoughts but the point of it all is not you know that you knew that there was this chaotic thought going on for 15 minutes where you're supposed to be quote unquote meditating. But in the rest of your day, these thoughts are still going on, but you're identified with them. So you're not aware of them. You see what I'm saying? You get lost in them. So you don't realize that your entire life is made up of these chaotic thoughts that you're just sort of you know, swallowed up with. But in meditation, you get to observe them and go, that's crazy. And so there becomes a little space. And that space is there and you can look at those thoughts and you, you, you know, you can see that clearly you're not your thoughts because you're the one observing them. There has to be a presence or an awareness or something that's observing these thoughts. So they, therefore they cannot be you. They cannot be because you're the one that's observing them. And that space that observes them is the authentic you. And it has, it's quiet. It can't, it can't have a thought because if it had a thought, that thought would have to be observed by something quiet that's you see what i'm saying yeah you know so to, to the rest in that place which you can't ever find because it's always here you can just sort of fall into it and you can notice it and when you notice it it'll come up as a thought you go oh wow i was really still for five minutes and thoughts back in so you you learn the system of thought coming and going you're resting in the stillness by becoming aware of the space between thoughts one of the things you told me too is um I was like, oh, you know, it's tough to find a quiet place to meditate. And you're like, well, you don't need a quiet place. The, the point of meditation is to be able to enter that stillness or observingness at, at, no matter what situation you're in. Yeah. Even if you're sitting in a busy airport, like you can still get to that state of calmness and, yeah. and observing. But yeah, it's a little tricky because you're not, you, you're not actually ever out of that space. Um, but at the start, we want to find a quiet place, right? And so, I mean, that makes sense. You're going to try to meditate, and then it's nice to be in a quiet space, and then you can really be, be still. But, um, you know, to, like a good meditative practice is, is like the whole day. See how present you can be, you know, with everything. I mean, meditating while you're talking to somebody would, 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 would go like, I'm talking to you, and I'm totally engaged in, in this conversation right now. There's no thoughts happening. Well, I'm talking to you right now. But if you become really aware and you start, you know, engaging in a meditative conversation, you may become aware that while you're talking with somebody, you're already thinking about your response to them or something that you need to do or something that you did this morning. So now you've lost that meditative state. So to be in meditation 24 hours a day is just to be fully present with whatever you're doing, you know, just fully present. You know, when you're walking, Listen to the sound of the shoes on the snow, crunching, crunch, 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 right? There's a door coming. Feel the cold door. Open the door. 
walk through the door. Look around the room before you, you know, go about your business. Be conscious. Instead of just being robotic in your actions, walking from place to place, be aware of every, like, what is the temperature? You know, it doesn't mean slow down and act like a zombie. Like, we're very capable of doing all this stuff outside of time, right? And just slowly, you know, become aware of everything. You, you'd be overwhelmed at the beauty everywhere. You know, the sensations, the energies, all the stuff. You start to become aware of it. That That's, you know, yourself, and that's a, that's a good meditation practice as opposed to the traditional sit on a couch kind of a thing. Would you say the psychedelics helped you get to this state, like where you can be more present, not just the meditation side? Like, do you think that because of some of your experiences, you're able to be more present? Well, I would have to say so, but I can't entirely say so because there was so much more. I mean, psychedelics was a part of my journey, but, you know, it was a small part compared to the daily meditation practice. Okay. Um, you know, an hour a day or two hours a day. Uh, you know, so it's hard, it's hard for me to say definitively anything. <laughs> you know, the mindfulness, meditation, uh, psychedelics to a certain extent are meditation. You know, they, they, they kind of show you those states of, of pure presence and stillness and what, you know, what that's about, you know, what is this, what, you know, what is available here in this moment? Uh, you know, so for me, because it's my journey, I would have to say, yeah, but, uh, it certainly doesn't seem to be the case for everybody. You know, I've met lots of people who, oh yeah, I do psychedelics and eat mushrooms. And I said, well, okay. And, and they don't seem to have that awareness, you know? So, uh, like you're, again, you're the, you're the, you're kind of in charge of the show, right? So if you're into like aliens and or whatnot, I mean, I mean, psychedelics are mind manifesting. So if you're into all this far out stuff and you want to communicate with aliens and all this, then that's going to be your gig, right? It's a tool uh, and it's only a tool. Uh, and it, it can be used uh, in lots of different ways. But for me, I'd have to say it was definitely part of my tool kit for sure. Um, and when you say you're the creator of your own reality, can you would you be able to tie in the law of attraction to that then? Like at what you're thinking about is what you're manifesting into your life. Can you create that? Well, it seems to be the case um, that whatever you're, whatever you're feeling is going to come into your life. Uh, and Jesus said it in the Bible somewhere about, uh, you know, you're, you know, he talked about feeling that whatever it is you were asking for, feel like it's already given, feel like it's already given, you know, Nestor Hicks, I think her, her book was asking is it is given. So, um, you know, manifesting is sort of like you are this energy and you're always attracting what you're feeling, you know, so it's not about thinking your way into it's about feeling it. So if you, you know, if you're, if your desire of manifestation is, is, uh, you know, a successful business or a, or, or a product of the, you know, commercial and economy or whatnot, a new car, go to that space of how am I going to feel when I, when I have this thing and then, and then really feel like it's happened already like it's already happened. Like for you, you know, how are you going to feel when your business is uber successful? Whatever that means for you. What's that feeling going to be? You know, and in that feeling, you know, you start to attract that which is necessary for that to come into this, into this reality. And two things kind of happen. You know, you start to attract that which is coming to you. But then you also relax quite a bit of the pressure that you're putting on um, the lack of not having it. Because... Um, you know, let's say I want to have this incredible experience of being successful, but what I'm actually feeling is the lack, the distance, because I believe the distance between now and success is this thing called time, and I'm focused more on the time. And so it, the universe is going to give you more of that time because that's what you're feeling. But if you start feeling like it's already happened, then you're not so worried about that gap because you're already feeling it's happened. You see what I mean? So that, that distance of that success story kind of vanishes because you're already in a place of feeling like it's happened. And then it kind of manifests so much more quicker because you're not concerned about it. You know, so, so the trick is to kind of like just relax into it. You know, like let it happen on its own accord and don't chase it. Don't put that energy on the gap or the distance because then you become like the hamster on the treadmill. You're like it's closer, it's closer, it's closer. I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Um, and I see this a lot in, Io in ayahuasca and, uh, you know, where some people are, it's always the next ceremony. It's always the next thing. So it's, they're always just so close to this revelation because they never actually believe they're there right now. Like it's, it, the belief is there's this thing called time and I need time to get to this place where everything's going to be better. You know, I mean, ask yourself that. I mean, who, who doesn't think that? Whenever you're on your life journey, fundamentally, most people believe that they're just a, a slight hair away 
or a bigger distance than, you know, from being where they actually want to be, whether that's retirement or the marriage or the house or the vacation home or the kids or the job. Everybody fundamentally walks around with this belief that it right now is, is just not quite fulfilling enough. Something needs to change. And as long as we believe that, there's this thing called time that gets created before us and we're always just one step away from it. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, in my experience is when you go to that place of everything is here and now, then you stop chasing it because it's like wishes are already fulfilled. Um, you know, it's, and, the, and again, I'm not a Bible quarter at all, but <laughs> it, it, this things will be added on to you. You know, you find that, that, that place of like completion and then everything will be added on to you and it won't affect you. It won't make your life, you know, better. And you always ask me these questions or like, we always do these incredible <laughs> things and you know, these <laughs> Are you excited? <laughs> you know, where the normal you know, response would be, oh, I can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm like, no, I'm never actually excited about anything. And I know you've, you always find that a bit weird. And I'm like, oh, it's not. I try to explain this and it's difficult because it's like, I mean, I'm in such a peaceful place that there isn't anything that can be added on to it. And so they, there's no excitement about anything coming in the future so much, you know, as there used to be. It's like, yeah, there's something amazing we're going to be doing tonight or we're going to go on this airplane ride or whatever but up until that moment I'm, I'm so present with where I'm at and that place wherever I'm at whether it's a day or hour week or month before is very complete and you, I mean complete's complete you know it's like you can't add on to it it's like you know things are really good you know well, I think that's the best way you ever put it and I have asked you that a lot of times and I'm <laughs> yeah. just you know because it's I, don't, yeah. I do get excited like I'm um, you know yeah. whatever Get a new animal or moving to a new house. To me, it's yeah. all, but yeah, maybe I'm not present enough. And Well, I just, don't be so hard on yourself. And I don't mean to deplete you because I know you're like, well, I don't want to be like Jeff. He doesn't get excited about anything. <laughs> you know, like, well, I guess, you know, it doesn't mean I, you don't enjoy every life I I moment, you know, to the fullest for sure. That's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, almost always, you know. And it doesn't mean that there isn't hardships or pain or struggle or you know, relationships that are hurting. It, it all There's space for all of it. I don't want to come across that, that my life's complete and everything's perfect. No, it's just as screwed up on one level as everything else. You know, there's there's relationships I wish were better. There's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff. There's challenges with, with children and, and uh, you know, finding a meaningful way to interact with this world because, you know, it, but all that stuff, there's space for it, you know, but, but deep inside, like in your heart, it's okay. I know it's okay. Everything, all is well, you know, one level or another. Uh, it's a short you know, trip from the cradle to the grave and we're all going the same place. And it's like, uh, you know, to not take things so seriously is, is uh, something that I sort of live by. Yeah, I've definitely been a lot more conscious of that. And I know, you know, some of the struggles I've gone through in the last, yeah, let's say six months to a year. But um, I'm definitely be in a state a lot more now. When even when, as these things arise, they don't drag on as long. You know, I'm like, yeah. you know what, this is just another hurdle and sure. or whatever it is and you know yeah. i can't attach myself to that thing and and can you say that there wasn't growth involved there always is always is always. right okay so we launched this this desire for growth and expansion and it comes through mostly pain yeah. right it's just that's just the way it is it's that really gets our attention it's like growing pains is a real thing and had you not gone through all of your growing pains you wouldn't be the person you are now you know and so when this really starts to sink in it doesn't ever mean that there's no pain and there's no, you know, pain coming or pain in the future. There always will be, but there starts to be an intelligence that sees that everything is happening for me and all of my pain and all of my struggle, there's, there's growth inside of it. There's a maturity, there's a gestation, there's a coming to, you know, to completion through our pain. You know, it's kind of, again, we're apparently in the Bibles today, like the Jesus on the crossing, he's suffering. He's like, Hey, I'm sorry, but this is the way, you know, the way is through pain. You know, the way is through pain. The growth is through pain. Growing pain is is the way. Uh, can we go grow through pleasure? Yeah, I think we're evolving to the point where we're learning that we can grow through pleasure as well. Um, but I think that's a more advanced stage at the beginning. It's got to be through pain because that's the only thing that gets our attention. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I see it in business all the time. Things are going well, you know, so you don't really dive into things yeah. too much. And then it all comes crashing down. You're like, oh, I got all these leaking holes here I need to fix. Yeah. Right. Like it all, it grabs your attention every time. Yeah. A hundred percent. It gets your attention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fully right. present. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> See, it's a pretty cool system. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, young Jamie, I'd like to talk a little bit about your uh, recent DMT experience. 
Yeah, it was because uh, <laughs> he 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 messaged me one day, Jeff, and he's like, "I'm not afraid to die anymore." <laughs> that was, I think, that well, was yeah, the message. That was the message. Like, obviously, it's on everyone's mind, you know, going through life. Like, you know, death is impending. This impending doom that's you know kind of creeping up on you, right? And um, yeah, for the longest time, I like, you know, whether I told people or not, like it's, I think it's a struggle that everyone kind of has, right? Like in in the back of their mind. But funny enough, I did it on my birthday this year. And a lot of people will go their entire life struggling with something. And they're scared of say like a DMT or an ayahuasca trip that, you know, DMT is a lot shorter in terms of duration than ayahuasca. But in a matter of a minute and a half, you can deal with it. The most important part of that DMT trip for me, like, was to the tune of like about 90 seconds, but it was the longest 90 seconds I will ever know. Yeah. (laughs) It was one of those experiences. And the thing with DMT, because you were saying ayahuasca kind of has like, you know, there's differing like people, your wife had a completely different experience than you, but... I find like just with some of the DMT kind of experiences I watched online, people went through it. They kind of report similar aspects or similar things. Like a lot of people say that they're going to the source or something. They're at the source of it all and this and that. And um, a lot of people experience death and rebirth, like in a matter of a minute and a half to a couple of minutes. Right. It was the first thing I said when I came back, I looked at them both. I'm like, I died. And they were like, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm like, guys, I died. I'm like, and it's okay. There's so much more to it than, than what we're seeing with like our, the filter over, right. Whether I was thinking of it every day or not, it was always in the back of my mind, right. There's all this stuff I want to do and we got to die and I don't want to leave this world. It's so beautiful. And I don't know what the psychedelics are doing, but they are revealing to you like the true meaning of life and like, you know, a matter of hours or, you know, a minute and a half, which was my case. Right. And yeah, it really opened me up to just like releasing myself, right? And and kind of, uh, uh, you know, and ever since then, I feel like I've been living the life that I want to without that impending doom feeling of like, oh no, this is all going to end someday. And it almost limits like my daily yeah. activities because I'm so, you know, like so paralyzed. Up. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and that's really what our fears do, whether, whether it's the fear of death or fear, fear of anything, yeah. you know, uh, they paralyze you from making any movement. Um, it, it, but the DMT just cuts right through it. And we don't know, I mean, you, you can't possibly explain it, but you know emphatically that w- this human incarnation, this existence is just a, just a blip. It's far more dreamlike than it was real. Yes. And, you know, which flips everything on its head. And you go, okay, well, there isn't, there can't be any death. You just know it because you, you're like, okay, you know, it's nice that this came back. I mean, that's always a relief, you know, because yeah. sometimes it's like, well, that's gone forever and that dream's over. Yeah. You know, and it makes so, and it, it's just like that. Well, that was a dream. Well, you know? <laughs> and it's funny you say that because one of the other things I said when I came out was yeah. it's weird how this was reality to me before that trip. Yeah. But when I came out, life was the dream. Reality became the dream and the dream became reality. Yeah. You leave it in an instant. Yeah. And it's like, but the dream stops in an instant and time stops, you know, which is a hard thing to explain, but you recognize the illusion of time and you go, Okay, that, I dreamt those 28 or 35 years. Yes. They actually didn't happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is all happening now. Yeah. And at this moment, I'm just waking up from that dream of time and separation and individuality yeah. and reconnecting with whatever you might want to call that. But then there's, you know, this appreciation for the gift when you come back because you get it again. It's like you get another chance here to appreciate this gift. Yeah. You know, without the edge of fear. Again, on that, do you believe in, like, you know, that we come back again and. We're going through this life in different forms. Well, I don't, I don't know if I have a belief structure, you know, uh, around any of, of any of that. Um, you know, it just doesn't seem to, uh, uh, I don't know. I just, I'm not really into belief structures. They're just beliefs, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's like uh, there's something really intelligent happening. That That's a fact. Uh, everybody's on the life journey and they're growing. That's a fact. Um, you, you know, in your individual life stream, does it, does it reincarnate and, and come again? Um, I think because of your law of attachment and attraction, it would seem obvious that it must, you know, like if you reach the end and there's something unfulfilled here, um, because the physical universe is a place for fulfilling desires, you know, that's where the Buddha says, you know, be free of all desires. Well, it's, you know, nice to say, but the easiest way to do that is to go fulfill some. Uh, and then you realize that they weren't fulfilling. 
But if, if you know, you're at the end of your life and there, there's all the stuff you wanted to do, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to take another incarnation. You know, you wanted to play the guitar, you might come back and specifically play the guitar. And so you have a life stream that's like designed around playing the guitar. You get a human birth, you grow up and you tell your parents, I just want to play the guitar. They tell you you're a loser because you got to get a job and that's not how it works. So your whole life is now devastated because the only thing you want to do is play guitar. And it's just that simple, maybe. You know, I want to experience different parts of the world. I want to see what it's like to live, uh, you know, in poverty. And then when you do that, you realize that's actually closer to being, you know, wealthy than living in wealth is actually more constricting and more in poverty in so many ways, right? So there's diversity of experiences that could obviously only be experienced through a multitude of lives, you know. And when you finally drop all of your uh, ideas about everything, you know, you might become free enough to be like, yeah, I'm kind of good with that, you know, human experience thing. It's full of a lot of flash and smell and taste and, cool experiences but it's all really fleeting and not fulfilling and yeah who who, who knows you know <laughs> yeah the one thing you said really resonated with me is uh like i always wanted to be a pro motocrosser i was like i would eat sleep and breathe yeah. this stuff like get up and train and run and eat and healthy and ride every day after school and it was just all i could think about and then you know as you get to 16 17 your parents say, well you need to get a job and that's not realistic and yeah. You know, it's still to this day, I'm like, I wish, wish I had seen where I could have went with it. Right. I mean, obviously it wasn't my life journey and I know that now or I wouldn't be here, but it was, you know, big passion of mine that was taken away for sure. Yeah. And there's an, and there's an unfoldment with time, um, that maybe you'll see or not see that whatever your journey is on was perfect and it didn't, it didn't go that way. It wasn't supposed to go that way. You know, reality is perfectly unfolding all the time only. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, Byron Katie would, would look at that and say, you know, um, you know, only the thought that I wished I would have is causing you that pain. You know, if you didn't have that thought, there'd be no pain there. You know, if you didn't say, I wish I would know what that would have been like. Um, you know, another way to look at that is you could say, okay, thank you. You know, thank you for sparing me. Thank you for sparing me. You know, that obviously wasn't supposed to be my path because it isn't. Right. So if you come back to the one fundamental truth is that reality is always absolutely perfect. And anything you didn't do, you shouldn't have done. And therefore, if there's a relationship that didn't happen, you thank you for sparing me that. You know, if there's something you didn't do in your life, thank you for sparing me that. Geez, I really wanted that, you know. And I'm sure there's a country song, right? Thank you, know, unanswered prayers, you know. And so this intelligence can wake up and go, oh, boy, you know, I sure wanted that. Thank, you know, thank you, you know, <laughs> for redirecting me. So whatever was going on on that live stream, you know, you got to let it go and just be all thankful and I, I got to experience some of that passion and now it's redirected towards something else. Yeah. The crazy thing about, uh, cause you're talking about, you know, reincarnation and stuff like that. For me personally, when I entered that zone, it like the last thing on my mind was like this world, everything just fell apart. And as I was falling back, I thought, oh God, I'm dying. Like you really did it this time, Brody. And, but then next thing you know, it's almost like a nuke just hit the house that I did it in because I had no recollection of it. It was gone. It was, it was the most unimportant thing in my mind at that time or whatever I was at that time. I wasn't thinking about this reality. So even if that was my death, you have no chance to even think about it because you are in such, like, I felt like I was at the source. And to me, that was the most important place mm -hmm. in the universe. It, you know, earth is just minuscule compared to where you go when you're in that state. And the wild thing was, is, I felt like I had been there before. Dimethyltryptamine is produced during um, birth and death and it like secretes a bit when you're dreaming. So like it felt like I had been there before almost like as I was going in, I'm like, oh no, like, you know, I've been here before. Like this is the source of it all, like where dreams are made and where, you know, like people go to die. Like this is the place. And it's not earth. It's, it's there. Like as far as I'm concerned, you yeah, know I mean? they refer to it as the void in religious traditions. Yeah. Like the Buddhists call it the void, and it, the, the the remembering of it is almost uh, overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's like if we woke up from this live stream right now and actually remembered our true nature, it, it's overwhelming because yeah, it is remembering. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. how could I have forgotten this? How mm -hmm. could how could that veil have been pulled over so heavily that I forgot who I was and believe myself to be a separate individual? in a separate life stream. And that's kind of like the game of the universe. Like it forgets itself in order to enjoy the separation so that I can look at Dan and see how pretty he is and, you know, and all this stuff. And so I can see flowers. And, but it's really all there's one self. There's, yeah. Yeah, right now we're talking to ourselves. 
you know, say hello. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he used to confuse the hell out of me with that one. Yeah. Like we're all just one. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and there's, these experiences are just so plainly obvious when they come. And there's so much compassion that comes with that too. Because, I, you know, I remember having, uh, you know, my parents came to mind, you know, one of these times and I was like, I had the compassion like they were me. Like they were small versions of me. And at that point I experienced what compassion was. Like true compassion is an actual experience. It's not an idea. It's not like, oh, I'll be nice to you. And that's compassion. No, it's an actual experience. Like if I threw water on you <laughs> and I don't know how many people actually experience, you know, true compassion or true love, you know, or true oneness, you know, they're, they're, they're real things and they're not ideas, yeah. you know, and, and that's what these things, like the substances give us a chance to experience that. And go, oh my God, this is what they're talking about. It's always oh, unbelievably overwhelming. Yeah. You're next. No, nope. you look <laughs> like you're going to say something. No, no, I was, I was, that's, I was teeing that up. <laughs> right. Well, no, I was going to say we are, I was going to give you the hour one. Yeah, no, okay. Well, I mean, I'm super stoked with how this conversation turned yeah. out from a, from a simple text. Should I come over? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> we always have good conversations. Yeah, we do. I, yeah, I, yeah uh, real good. I've grown a lot over the course of our friendship and, and I appreciate everything you've done for me, so. Thanks oh. for coming. Well, on likewise. Podcast. Well, you know? and I, I don't think this one's over either. I think he's, he needs a part two. <laughs> <laughs> Done deal. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on, Jeff. Very good. Thank you. Welcome to the winner's circle. If you made it here, it means you didn't put in the work, dude. Congratulations. You made it way past the basics. This goes for a massive celebration. Welcome to the winner's circle.